Hey ho, Tudor minded people. I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. We're Tudor Time Machine, and this is episode 43 of our podcast. Thank you for listening. If this is your first time finding us on the podcast sphere, <laughs> it's best to start at episode one. This is a story project. It goes in order, and we don't want you to miss any of the twists and turns. We're really excited to be reaching thousands of Tudor-minded listeners from all over the world. We've had such an amazing time imagining this project and especially sharing it with everyone. And if you're enjoying it, support us. Buy some Tudor Time Machine swag. Yes, go to our Tudor Time Machine Facebook page, hit the Shop Now button, and you'll see the items we have for sale. So get a Do You Tutor tee or a sweatshirt and support the podcast at the same time. In our last episode, we visited Cecilia as she was absorbed by the practice of alchemy. But now we're off to Barnard's Inn to see Francis Darrell wrangle his nephew. After the reading, we'll have some fun discussing the history beyond our tale and making connections between then and now. Read on, Jesse. Chapter 43, Near Barnard's Inn, in which two cousins meet, and the pomander is one. London was a proper town, thought Sir Francis. Why did he not leave Littlecote more often? The country could not compare. The buildings, the crowds, the street merchants, the wine, the food. Why lie to himself? It was the ladies, the London ladies. They stood near him, they touched him as they laughed. They did not fuss about their maidenhead. And a princess, a true blood princess, he had never thought to bed such a one. He almost fell off his horse remembering the quality of her skin, the silk of her hair. And he had done well. She liked him. For the night, at least, he had held a royal in his arms. Zoons, he would be going back to Little Coat with some tales to tell. He had done well. He had pleasured a princess, and his cock had sprung back to life in an instant. Ah, yes. Captain Cork was a fiery devil. The Princess Cecilia Vasa of Sweden. The title alone might have intimidated another man, made him go soft as a squashed pear, but Captain Cork had endured with the stiffness of an oak tree. The princess in her heights had called out odd things. A milkmaid he had had once yelled out her favorite cow's name. The princess, she called on immortality and kingdoms. But that was power. If he had another chance, he would cry, Tournament winner! Or, Champion! Champion! That he would say. And the heart-stopping mistress of the inn... She had also taken a fancy to him. She must have been up very early to be dressed so beautifully and standing there so patiently in front of his door when he opened it. How she had tried to keep him from leaving that morning. Her talk of bad weather and a rough ride through the city, the warnings about thieves trying to take his father's jewel, the breathless invitation to sojourn a while and play a game of cards, the insistence that he go about his business another day. The way she kept looking at him. Could he bed her too? And he had seen some other pretty ladies. Even that lady there, being carried in a sedan chair beside him. Who might that be? Was she a woman who enjoyed carnal life? His spirits were soaring. A warm spring wind was at his back. His nephew might just give him a full share of the Wyatt property. Why not? Things were going better than he could ever have imagined. Sir Ralph, that man was a pudding, told him Sir George Wyatt's place of lodging. Why George had sent him to the Arundel Inn if he himself lodged elsewhere, he would never know. But he blessed George for it. He had not had to pay a penny, and it was the finest lodging he had ever had. He was about to meet his nephew and get his inheritance as Uncle Francis, lover of the Swedish princess. Zooms. The boys of Barnard's Inn carried horse tails, and one pimply lad rode a hobby horse. Two young fellows were weighed down by branches of silk. Some were plotting with fireworks. A revel. London, always something afoot. Francis sent his manservant off to the stables with his horse. George would be merry and invite him to stay to watch the spectacle. A mischievous lad put down an armful of masks and began to hold one after another in front of his face. Each had a different beard. With every new guise, the boy changed his voice and stroked the fake piece, yelling insults. Rank, fen, sucked, maggot pie. Then, you be slobbering, ill-bred barnacle. Then, puny sheep-biting foot licker. Francis found him a likely fellow. In between beard changes, Francis asked him which room might be Sir George Wyatt's, and stroking his long grey whiskers, the boy answered that George could be found upstairs. What a friendly lot. Nephew, Francis greeted as he swung open George's door. The lad looked up with a sour expression, holding a gown in his hands. Who might you be? Are you a reveller? Why did you not knock? 
Returning to the door, Francis knocked vigorously. I have done. Rouse yourself. It is I, Sir Francis Darrell, the happy bastard, your loving uncle. Francis patted his own chest. Who? Who do you say you are? An uncle? Who has put you up to this? You will not make a fool of me. A wary lad, Francis thought. Yet it showed sense. He had appeared unannounced. Bowing with great flourish, he humbled. I have come as you requested. I waited for you at the Arundel Inn, sir, but my impatience brought me here. I have never heard of you. I made no arrangement to meet you, George spluttered. Of course you did. I am no impostor, dear nephew. I wear the jewel. Sir Thomas Wyatt was my father, your grandfather. His nephew judged him and turned away. The boy's voice came back to him. Close the door and get away. I must dress for the revels. Francis was not perturbed. George wanted to test him, to discover who he might be. He walked into the room. Aha! Perfect! A portrait of Sir Thomas Wyatt was propped up on a table against the wall. Acting a deep-voiced chorus, Francis took up his father's pose and intoned, I am the bastard. I am Thomas Wyatt's bastard. George pulled at his costume and ran a line of curses under his breath. Francis laughed. Come now, cause you sent for me. I am your kinsman. He waved at the portrait of Sir Thomas, indicating the red hair, the straight nose, and making a circle around his own face. And have I not worn the pomanda? He reiterated by holding it up. His nephew, he decided, did not have an overabundance of wit. George whipped around, his eyes darting between the picture and the pomanda Francis wore. You knave! You thief! Give me that! Francis backed away. Why the insults, cuz? I am not your cuz. I am not your cuz. Give me that jewel or I will run you through. George bolted over to his bed and drew a dagger that stood beside it. Francis pulled out his sword to block the wild thrusts of his bumbling nephew. You are an angry puto, Francis said. George's hands fluttered everywhere, one poking the dagger willy-nilly, his other circulating, opened palm. Francis fixed on the knife hand. He would not be struck by this bungler. Ah, oh, you have struck me, cried George. I have not. Indeed, George held up his hand, revealing a long, thin scratch. Oh, what ho there, I have oversharpened my blade. I will help you clean it, or call a surgeon if you like. Never. You will hear from my sponsor, Sir Henry Lee. You will pay for this assault. I am not without high friends. The boy was shaking. Francis wanted to reassure him. It is not a deep wound, cuz. I will gladly pay the medical man. Come, I will carry you on my back to see him. Francis went to pick George up. Unhand me, oaf, rogue. You insult me, you egg-sucking, mindless, toady, coward, you repellent scullion, you. See to your wound, cuz. The sight of blood has overheated you. You brainless country rube, you. The spillage of emotion disturbed Francis. This George was a muck of spleen. He must not have seen his own blood before, poor young pup. He, Francis, must bide his time. His nephew would regain his composure, and all would be well. I will wait on you at the Arundel Inn, cuz, this evening, when you have regained yourself. I look forward to it with anticipation. Francis bowed himself out the door. Francis had the afternoon before him. He would see the sights of the city, the menagerie at the tower, cross the river for bear baiting and a good meat pie, then finish by a barge ride to see the expanse of Whitehall from the Thames as the sun was slipping down. At the end of the day, Mistress Arundel greeted him, very happy to see him again. She was so solicitous, offering to have water warmed for a wash. The soap maker had brought her some new soap she enticed, made with cloves. He must try it. There was a chamber with a bathtub at his disposal for no extra charge. He bounded up the stairs to put away his cloak. A knock on the door. The lustily impatient Mistress Arundel? No, a page with a note from his nephew's sponsor, Sir Henry Lee offering him a portion of the Wyatt land in Dorset. All he need to do was banish himself from Sir George and swear forever and always to make no further claims on any land or goods. Easily done, happily done. Francis loved London. Fortune smiled at him in this city of wonders. And now, what was this? Here was the cock-stiffening Swedish princess at his door. Huzzah! Ah, Cecilia breathed as he kissed her. How can you resist? But this time you must play a game with me. Royal lady, how could you be more charming? I enjoy games. What will it be? You must come to my room to discover. As she glided away, Francis followed, reasoning that he was man enough for both, first the Swede, then the mistress of the inn and her body bath. 
the game was sent, played on the princess's bed, the curtains pulled close shut for privacy. She dealt the cards, and when he reached for his purse to take out a coin for the pot, she stopped his hand. Dear sir, there are more exciting things to play for than money. Considering his recent run of luck, Francis was sure it would be the princess who would be naked in a few moments. His first hand was won, and he helped her unpin the ruff around her neck. By God, she was clean. Not a speck of dirt on her. Such was royalty. Her sleeves were next. Watching them fall onto the bed, exposing her delicate arms, put him in a slow, easy mood. Even the cards in London showed him favour. The princess curled and smiled, and while he enjoyed the thought of himself as the easy champion, one hand of cards and then two slipped away from him. It surprised him when he found himself naked, while she remained almost fully clothed. A feeling of losing, yet winning, tickled him. Everything was gone, even his rings and his pomander, but he was confident that if he provided well for his princess, he would get his breeches back. Cecilia clomped down the stairs of the inn, her little feet at sea in such big boots. The young man's gravy-smelling clothes suited her. She would spend some of her immortal life as a man. She could be a king, an emperor, a pope, or spend twenty years ruling the Vatican, or lead a crusade. What a soldier she would be, taking a thrust to her immortal heart and laughing at the blood. The weight of the lad's sword charmed her. The heavy pomander thumped on her chest. She would look lustily at a few ladies. When she dressed as a boy for her dear husband, it was a pleasure. But this had an extra flavour. Cecilia would ride astride a big horse back to Bedford House and rouse her household and begin her packing. It was time to journey to her mother's resting place. Oh, mother, dearest mutter, first the gift of life and now of immortality. Hopefully George can show off the tiny wound <laughs> Sir Francis has given him in one of the revels he's getting ready for. Being there at the inns of court with these witty boys has really taught him to be good at insulting with flair. But our Francis Darrell will never have such a tongue for insults. No, oh, he's a man for wine, women, and song. But these supposed students, England's best and brightest at the inns of court, are putting on fake noses and preparing for the revels, which is a period of celebrations often around Christmas. But it could go on much longer, from All Saints' Eve all the way to Lent. And that is a long celebration. We've talked about the Inns of Court before, but we just want to recap. So the Inns of Court were, and still are, a place to learn the legal profession. During the Tudor era, hundreds of years before the Tudor era, and up until today. And that was not the only way they functioned in the Tudor period. They were also kind of a third university, similar to Oxford or Cambridge. And that doesn't mean the Inns of Court or Oxford and Cambridge were for the best students in the land. What that means is that landed gentry attended these institutions, and those boys may or may not get any type of degree. They may have simply gone to the Inns of Court to enjoy their time and make connections. So what else is new? So we're just talking about wealthy men under 30, because women, of course, could not attend in this time period. Women were not admitted into the Inns of Court until 1919. So yes, it's quite a few years later <laughs> than our period. Yes. But young men had been attending the Inns of Court for hundreds of years by the Tudor time. Yes, and since the 14th century. So attending seems to have been some kind of rite of passage. In this time period, there's kind of a proto-capitalism, and the size of the legal profession is definitely growing under Elizabeth. And as merchants and yeomans have more money, they want to send their kids to professional school. So those men are at the inns to get a degree and to have a real profession, but other people are not. The inns had rooms to stay in, like dormitories today, and they provided meals in a common area where you could also do your networking. So the rooms were often owned by a family, and they were passed down to family members or to friends. And if you were not from one of those families, getting a room was much more difficult than actually getting accepted. And it wasn't until 1590, okay, remember the Inns of Court have been in operation for hundreds of years by then, that you had to declare 
declare that you actually wanted to be a lawyer to go to the Inns of Court. And did you have to pass a big scary exam so that you were able to be worthy of practicing the law? Or show that you had finished a particular program? No, you had to show proficiency at something much more essential. You had to show that you had eaten a certain number of meals in the dining hall. (laughs) <laughs> it is important for a lawyer to be able to eat a good dinner. And make good conversation yeah. over that dinner, I yes. suppose. But to be fair, putting together all these young gentlemen who have money, creativity, and time, and who valued the arts, results in some, I mean, in our opinion anyway, very desirable evolutions of the theater, set design, acting, and of course, writing. These kind of creative explorations that went on at the ends of court, actually as entertainments in the dining hall, they began many years before Elizabeth. Entertainment at the ends of courts are virtually as old as the ends themselves. There are records that there were spectacles that were almost like a mask, but with a plot in 1489. And they call these very early productions that were done at the end of the 1400s at Gray's Inn, disguisings. I love that, disguisings. Mm -hmm. It's so evocative. The revels have disguisings. It sounds magical. (laughs) It was a tremendous amount of work to put on this magic and to put all these entertainments together because there were performances or plays virtually every Saturday night during the revels. That's a lot of plays. In this time period, they would elect someone to be in charge of the whole thing. The tutors were always doing that, delegating jobs. And this job was very important at the Inns of Court. And it wasn't a job that you were paid for. Quite the opposite. It was a job that you paid to do. So you were a student or associated with the Inns of Court, and then you were financially responsible for everything at the Rebels. That's amazing because productions are expensive, and they always have been. And there were actually two positions. One was the master of the Rebels, who oversaw the Christmas feasts, the music, the dancing, and gambling. Mm -hmm. And then the other position was the Prince of Misrule. And we've seen different Princes of Misrules. Mm -hmm. And they take care of what we would think of as the staged entertainment. And that could be a mask or a play. And it's interesting because the Prince of Misrule gives you this idea that this was somebody who sowed chaos. But actually, this Prince of Misrule basically was like a producer. And these revels included tons of different elements. There were solemn revels, which consisted of singing psalms and stately dancing. Boring, 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 boring. (laughs) Yes. I mean, the students must have felt like that, too. They wanted something raucous and co-ed. I mean, not that the women were allowed to act, but they definitely came to these more lusty revels. Part of the revels was dancing, and they did 16th century dirty dancing, like the Gilliard, which involved the man hoisting the lass up on his hip and spinning her around. Now that sounds fun. Mm -hmm. I wish we still did dances like that. But they also did performances, and many of the most famous 16th and 17th century playwrights had the first performances of their work done at the Inns of Court. It was sort of where they workshopped their plays a little bit. And I think that was wise because these audiences were very responsive and very intellectual, and they probably gave them notes. I mean, just like we do now, right, with a workshop production. And they also did not just full plays, but they did a lot of masks. And we still have the scripts of some of the most famous of these masks. But for modern production, masks are not so common. It's such a more stylized form. Just the fact that everyone would, in fact, be in a mask might be, I don't know, a little disconcerting for a modern audience. Have you seen The Masked Singer? When celebrities (laughs) get in enormous costumes and the contestants have to guess who the (laughs) singer is? I mean, isn't it the most popular show on American network TV? No, okay, okay, I take your point. (laughs) They're not put off by the masks. You don't see a lot of classical theater companies doing mask festivals. There's no... Stratford Mask Fest or Royal Mask Company or free masks in Central Park. Masks haven't translated to our taste the way Shakespeare has. And some of them might have been performed separately on the 16th century stage during an interval or a long set change. But some of them were rolled up into a play. Shakespeare does that in Henry VIII, in The Tempest, in Romeo and Juliet. In a lot of plays, there's a mask element. Mm -hmm. Masks, as they were performed in the 16th and 17th centuries, originated in Italy, and they have some of the elements of Commedia dell'arte. Masks or wizards are worn, and the action is often more movement-based than in a play. Masks are usually 
allegorical, and they often are stories of gods or personified qualities like delight, grace, love, <laughs> harmony, or activities like reveling or sport or laughter. And those activities are characters. Mm -hmm. They're depicted as characters. And masks are usually much shorter than a full play. And they're actually quite short, like a skit. They're not set in a specific country or town, but in some ideal region. The house of chivalry, the hill of knowledge, the house of Oceanus, the fountain of light. Sounds a little bit like a science fiction. It does. Everyone's it in does. a mask and they're in some sort of netherland. Yes, in the fountain of light. Yeah. Rhymed verse is used. No one speaks in prose. And often masks were performed privately and the actors and actresses were amateurs. But at court and in the most elaborate productions, they were performed by a mixture of professional and amateurs. And they were typically written for a particular occasion. And the mask might reference a theme that was fit for the occasion. And let's be clear, there were women who were allowed to take part in these masks, but they were not allowed to speak. They were allowed to do the dancing, maybe songs, but they didn't speak. So that was one of the limitations of these women who were, in this case, able to be on stage. Amateurs might have been in the masks, but the costumes and scenery were incredibly elaborate. And again, putting on a performance, it was an incredibly expensive pastime. Part of the fun was that within the mask proper, there was usually a ridiculous mask called an anti-mask, performed partly by servants and partly by actors. So this sort of entertainment requires unbelievable planning, rehearsals, space. Most of the time, people didn't want to pay for the entire thing themselves, so they had to do fundraising. I mean, then is now, right? And they had to enlist people to help them, beg them, of course. You had to be in a certain position to take on this kind of responsibility mm -hmm. for the rebels or to be the prince of misrule. And actually, some men who attended the Inns of Court had a clause that they would not take on one of these <laughs> positions because it was so expensive. It makes me think a little bit of when Lord William Cecil begged Queen Elizabeth not to come to his house while she was on her summer progress. The expense was just not worth the honor. Well, and especially not for Cecil. I mean, he was about as high up as he could get. And you know what? Actually, I'm sure he could have afforded the queen coming to visit. He had socked away a lot of money by that point. But maybe he funded a performance that year <laughs> and then he was broke. So that's why he couldn't afford for her to come. And he was an alum. So these performances were such an important part of the Inns of Court and of the social life of London. Everyone attended them, even if they didn't want to pay to have the productions mounted. And now, of course, alumni go back to their colleges to see sporting events. And that's a big thing that you kind of have this pride of your school. And I wonder if there was some element of that going on too. Oh, like I'm you went sure back to was. see how well your inn did against another inn in terms of the rebels and how, how well it was done. So there was a lot of school pride. So then as now, yeah. these were not actually performances that you could buy a ticket for. They were private, only for people at the inns. And other people who were in the know, alum, um, yeah. high Maybe up had, years. had given you some money, yes. fundraising. And the men who performed the plays and masks were a mixture of professional actors, as we said, and amateur players who were enrolled at court. But the musicians were almost all professional. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a very expensive undertaking. They were quote-unquote amateur players, but that doesn't mean they didn't have an incredible amount of influence or an amazing actual acting ability. I'm sure you had to be really good to get into one of these revels because the queen herself was known to attend the performances at the inns of court. You couldn't have people who couldn't say their lines or weren't good at dancing or singing to perform in front of the queen. Though they're amateurs, it doesn't mean that they didn't see it as a huge networking right. chance. And supposedly at one of these performances is where she first saw Christopher Hatton and admired his dancing ability. <laughs> His legs in those tights. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Years later, he became her Lord Chancellor. That was some good networking yeah, he got yeah, out of that. Yeah. The Queen sees you in this format of acting and dancing, and that isn't something that demotes you in her view, right? Because we, I think we sometimes have this weird idea that somehow in this period, being an actor, being a dancer, being a singer was sort of looked on as very low class. You actually read that quite a lot. And it, I just don't think it was true. This was a way to show your abilities. Some of the 
masks, you might have been speaking Latin or speaking another language or something. So you're also showing your intellectual gifts and your dancing. And these abilities all contribute to you as a person worthy of being at court. Many of the young men who wanted to be actually lawyers wanted the oratory parts because it showed what good speakers they were and that they should be hired to be your lawyer with their fabulous voice and ability to command themselves on stage. There could even have been some people who ended up going into the professional theater. There's a famous story about Dudley himself connected to these inns of court. In 1561, there was a special mask that was played before Queen Elizabeth. It was called Gorbidot. But it was done to honor Robert Dudley because Robert Dudley had helped one of the inns of court. Mm -hmm. Two of the courts had gotten into dispute over something. Sort of like if two schools were in dispute over a stadium. A or stadium. A field or, yeah. Dudley got Elizabeth to intervene on behalf of one of the inns of court, and that inn of court made him the prince of misrule. Because of th- this intervention, they pledged that they would never give legal counsel against Dudley. In other words, none of their graduates would ever plead against Dudley in a court, which is pretty amazing. And unlike what we so often see in the Tudor period, well, in any period, they actually stuck by this pledge. And in 1576, they still honored Dudley and called him chief governor of this house. If you went to a law school and no one would ever argue a case against you? Well, we couldn't possibly do that now. But as time goes on, these revels rely more and more on professional players. Some of the most influential playwrights of the period had their plays performed during these revels at the Inns of Court. Because, as we've said, it was really a place to be noticed. Because Elizabeth was attending, as we've said. Yeah. But also Burley, Sir Walter Raleigh, Sir Francis Walsingham, Francis Bacon, and the Earl of South. Hampton. You mean the one whose name we can never pronounce, Henry Worthesley? Yes. Wor- yes. Wor- yes. Wor- that <laughs> one. He was Shakespeare's patron, and it's speculated this patronage was why the Comedy of Errors was played at the Inns of Court in 1594. He got him in. And Twelfth Night in 1602. All these productions were to entertain the dining hall crowd, but it was a who's who mm-hmm. of the Elizabethan hoi polloi who were at these dinners. And Shakespeare's rival and friend, Ben Jonson, was also associated with the Inns of Court. And do you know what really annoys me? Just the one thing? What is (laughs) it? (laughs) I have often read that Shakespeare could not have written his plays because he wasn't university educated. But actually, Ben Jonson, who was considered one of the big intellectual playwrights of the late 16th and early 17th century. He wasn't university educated. That's so true. And he was apprenticed to his stepfather, who was a bricklayer. I know, and everybody talks so much about how Shakespeare's father made gloves, so he couldn't possibly have sired this great author. But Ben Jonson's stepfather, as you said, was a bricklayer, and Ben Jonson himself worked as a bricklayer. He stayed in the guild his entire life just in case his writing gig didn't work out and he needed the money. And we think that's fantastic. There's nothing wrong with that. But I guess what we're suggesting is the idea that somehow Shakespeare couldn't have written his work because his father made gloves and he didn't go to the university. When you compare it to these other amazing luminaries of that period, it, it's just a ridiculous idea. Ben Johnson also served as a foot soldier. There's nothing wrong with that, but it is considered a sort of lower class thing to do, right? And he began his career as an actor, which he apparently was not very good at. He was brilliant, though even though he wasn't university educated. And there were men from the universities who wrote at this time, and they were called the university wits. The university twits? (laughs) No, (laughs) wits. So they didn't attend the end of courts. They were more the Cambridge, Cambridge, Oxford. the The Oxbridge. And some of their names... You may recognize Christopher Marlowe, Robert Greene, Thomas Nash, Thomas Lodge, George Peel. And you know what? They are familiar, especially Marlowe. But I would argue that Shakespeare and Ben Jonson, the people who did not go to Oxbridge, are more familiar, perhaps, to many people than Thomas Nash, Thomas Lodge, and George Peel. Well, in Elizabeth's reign and into James I's reign, these university wits did want to be paid a complete change of ideas about what it means to be a gentleman who is paid for making art. 
during his lifetime, Thomas Wyatt and the other courtier poets, you know, such as Henry Howard, they didn't want to be paid for their writing, that they thought it was kind of beneath them as gentlemen. So much of the development of the London theater of the 16th century at the ends of courts sort of came about because the administration of the inns were trying to keep the students off the streets and out of trouble. <laughs> that was a hard job, I'm sure. Or as they like to say, they wanted to keep them from night wandering. They might have kept them off the London streets, but these soon-to-be lawyers, <laughs> if they were, they were very destructive during the rebels. There are records from 1529, 30 and 4950 and 1570, 71. So it went on and on. Yes. The destruction went on. That carpenters had to be sent out mm -hmm. to mend furniture and that so many things were broken during the rebels. Gray's Inn in 1594, 1595, the following was reported. There arose such a disordered tumult and crowd upon the stage that there was no opportunity to effect that which was intended. There came so great a number of worshipful personages upon the stage that might not be displaced, and gentlewomen whose sex did privilege them from violence, that when the prince and his officers had in vain a good while expected and endeavored a reformation, at length there was no hope of redress for that present. The Lord Ambassador and his train thought that they were not so kindly entertained as was before expected, and thereupon would not stay any longer at that time, but in a sort discontented and displeased. After their departure, the throngs and tumults did somewhat cease, although so much of them continued as was able to disorder and confound any good inventions whatsoever." I feel bad for whoever wanted to actually do their play that night. because, I, And who knows why this happened, too. Like, what made everybody storm the stage like that? You can see why no one would want these men wandering around at night destroying London. No, and the way they talked about this crazy behavior in other instances and in other reports, when you read it, it seems tame because they say they want to avoid, quote, great disorders and misdemeanors by hurly-burlies, crowds, errors, confusions, vain representations and shows. I think it's the use of hurly-burly. It just doesn't sound dire. No, it doesn't sound potentially deadly violent. <laughs> no. it, it just sounds kind of fun. You know, when you get a big crowd in there, especially when people are armed, it must have been extremely dangerous. I read that the worst riot was actually not at the ends of court, but was at Cambridge in 1610, 1611 during those Christmas revels. Wow, who knew Christmas plays could be so violent? Maybe George White is a good example of what a temperamental crowd it was. Well, yeah, with his pulling his dagger out. Next time we'll be seeing some more Tudor temper and more riots in the streets of London. And don't forget, if you're enjoying the story, support us. Buy some great Tudor Time Machine swag. Yes, go to our Tudor Time Machine Facebook page. Hit the Shop Now button and bye, bye, bye. And join us next time for more Times Riddle and more Tudor Minded Talk. <laughs>